I would like to start off this week's episode of Residue with a trigger warning for domestic violence against women and children. I also wanted to tell everyone that everyone deserves relationships free from domestic violence. If you or anyone you know needs help, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline 24-7, 365 days a year at 1-800-799-SAFE, or you can text S-T-A-R-T to 88788. You deserve to feel safe in your relationship. Hello, my name is Chrissy Champagne. You are listening to Residue, a true crime podcast dedicated to keeping you paranoid. As I said in the beginning of this episode, there is a trigger warning for domestic violence. Some of you may remember this case by the made-for-TV movie from 1989 called A Cry for Help, The Tracy Thurman Story. Now, this was a pretty vicious movie, especially because it was made for TV. And I saw this as a child, maybe like a 12-year-old. Maybe I was around 12 years old. And some of the scenes are still shocking to this day when I watch them. The Tracy Thurman case was a landmark legal case in the United States that led to a significant change in the way that police departments handle domestic violence calls. In 1989, a made-for-TV movie titled A Cry for Help, The Tracy Thurman Story starred Nancy McKeon as Tracy Thurman and Dale Midkiff as her husband, Buck. This movie was a horrific look into what happens when domestic violence cases are not taken seriously by the police. As a teenager, Tracy lived in Torrington, Connecticut, and she was only 17 years old when she decided to move away from Torrington and go to Florida. The reason that Tracy moved was a sad reason. Uh, The reason she moved was because her mother was diagnosed with cancer and Tracy had become her caretaker for many years. But sadly, Tracy's mother would pass away, and Tracy has said that she just wanted to get away from everything. She needed to get away from all of the memories here in Torrington and start a new life. So she actually dropped out of school and moved to Florida. In Florida, Tracy finds a job working as a maid at a hotel. While she's working at this hotel, she comes across a group of construction workers, and within that group, she would meet her future husband, Charles Buck Thurman. Now, Charles is going to start off as Prince Charming. He is going to love bomb the hell out of Tracy. And this is exactly what she needed at this point in her life. She felt so lonely at age 17, and now without her mother by her side, this was perfect. This man was like her protector, she would say. She felt like this was the love of her life, and she decided that this was going to be the man that she wanted to marry. Soon after the couple married, about three years later, they would have their first son, their first child and only child named Charles Jr. They would go on to call Charles Jr. CJ. It wasn't too long after the marriage that Tracy starts to realize that this love bombing is not true. Charles, or Buck as we're going to now refer to him, Buck was not a nice guy, and Buck would tell Tracy that he had an excuse for the way he behaved. He would tell her that 
As a child, he watched his own father beat his mother so often that his father was actually sent to prison for this. And this was his excuse that after his father was released, he went to rehab and he became a different man, a new man. So Tracy, just wait because I'm going to be a better man soon, just like my father. And of course, Tracy is believing this because you want to believe in the person that you love and you want to believe that they are not the monster that you keep witnessing every single day. In fact, the first time that Buck ever attacked Tracy and hit her, she hit back. She punched back and she was like, hell no, this isn't going to be happening this way. She ends up leaving Buck and moving back to Torrington, Connecticut with CJ. And she was going to, at that point, move in with some friends from Torrington named Judy Bentley and Rick St. Hilaire. And while she was staying with her two friends, Tracy was going to file for divorce. Tracy knew right away, especially after having a young child, this wasn't going to fly with her. We're not going to behave this way. I don't care what your dad did. I don't care how your dad got better. You and I, this ain't happening. So the badass that Tracy is moves away, starts the divorce process, but realizes that this is not an easy process. This is expensive. She doesn't know how to fill out the paperwork. There's no one around to help her out with all of this legality stuff that goes along with the divorce. So what does Tracy do? Tracy starts taking a class to teach herself how to go through the divorce process. And that's amazing to me. It just shows you even more how much of a strong woman this woman was. She was not going to let anything stop her from getting the life that she knew that she deserved. She sure as hell knew that she did not deserve getting beaten, getting talked down to, getting um, ridiculed and constantly put down by this man. And Buck was relentless. I am going to explain to you all of the things that Buck did leading up to one of the most horrific days in anyone's life. So now, Tracy's back in Torrington, Connecticut. She has escaped her abusive husband. She is living with two of her best friends, her child, and she is taking classes to figure out how to legally get separated, divorced, and get the hell away from this nightmare of a man. It is October 22nd, 1982, and who comes to Tracy's best friend's home but Buck? He finds out where Tracy is and he comes to the home and he starts harassing Tracy and her friends. At first, her friends did let Buck in because they didn't realize how scary this was really going to be. So the minute they actually let him into the home, he immediately attacks Tracy, grabbing her by the neck. The cops are called, the cops come, but they don't arrest Buck. And they don't arrest Buck because this is a matter between two married people. Not the police. These two got married. This is their problem. Interrupting this episode of Residue to introduce you to a new true crime show that I know you're going to enjoy. What's up, frickin' weirdos? My name is Kevin. And I'm the host of Where the Weird Ones Are podcast. This is a conversational podcast based on guest experiences and encounters with paranormal, cryptids, aliens, spirituality, mental health, as well as conspiracies. If these topics interest you, you can find me on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, as well as YouTube and Rumble. If you have an encounter or an experience of something that you can't quite explain, I would love to hear from you. You can reach out to me at where the weird ones are at gmail.com, where underscore the weird ones are on Instagram, 
and where the weird ones are on Facebook. I hope to hear from you, my friends. Question everything and stay weird. <laughs> Now, Buck doesn't only just come back that one time. He comes back again, and he wants Tracy to know that nobody will ever raise his son. He keeps coming back. He becomes an expert at stalking Tracy. And the cops still do nothing. Tracy's two friends who own the home and the property are now going to file a complaint with the police saying that uh, Buck was trespassing. And that complaint is denied. They're not taken seriously. So now Tracy isn't being taken seriously. Her friends are not being taken seriously. Police are just behaving like this is nothing to be worried about. On November 1st, 1982, Buck shows up again to Tracy's friend's home. This time he chokes Tracy and he tells her if she calls the cops, he will kill her. It is at this point that Buck kidnaps CJ. He grabs their son and he runs from the home and the cops still do nothing. It's fine because Buck is CJ's father. So whatever, he's fine. Why don't you two work this out on your own? It is at this point that Tracy now has to do what a lot of us understand She has to now sort of just play the game with Buck and she has to, you know, pretend she's still in love with him. Pretend that, listen, Buck, if you bring CJ home, we will sit down and we will discuss this divorce. I will get back together with you. This will not happen. Of course, Tracy is lying to get her son back. You have to do whatever you got to do to deal with such a narcissist like this. After CJ is returned, this is when Tracy files her first written report. And again, since she's legally married, this goes nowhere. It is November 5th, 1982. Tracy is at the police department because she is in the family relations office trying to discuss what to do, where to go next. Buck is also there. So as Tracy's leaving the police station, she gets into her car. She starts to drive away, but Buck stops her car. He jumps on her car. He is screaming at her in a police station parking lot. He is screaming, I'll get you. I'll hurt you. He even goes as far as to punch her windshield out. He just punches it. And that is when a police officer that was standing close by, that's when he decides, okay, I'm going to arrest this guy. Not when he was screaming, nothing like that. It was just purely because he broke the window. So the officer goes over there and he arrests Buck for the first time. And that arrest goes nowhere because Buck is standing in front of the judge and he tells him, I will stop. You know what? I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to stalk my wife anymore or beat her or harass her. So the judge is like, oh, okay, cool. So he gets probation for six months and it was called a breach of peace, meaning he won't go to jail unless he commits a crime during this six months. And then he would also be given a uh, conditional discharge. He would have two years of conditional discharge. Woo! I cannot say these words, which means that this is a minor crime. And when you have a conditional discharge, you are ordered for a period of time to meet specific conditions. And if you disobey any of those conditions, then you will come back and you will be convicted of a crime. Buck is told to go home to Virginia, where he is from, to go live with his father, to stay out of Torrington, Connecticut, and he does not go. He stays, okay? And two weeks later, what do you think happens again? Again, the police are called. Tracy is told, you married this man. 
So now, divorce papers are already served, and that is when Buck loses his damn mind. Even more than he already has. Neighbors would say that they would even see Buck waiting around the neighborhood, waiting for Tracy to come home, and her neighbors would call her and tell her, don't come home. Do not come home. Buck is standing outside. Things are going to get even worse now that Buck is looking at the divorce papers and the realization of this relationship coming to an end is staring him right in the face. The threats are getting worse. The stalking is getting worse. Tracy goes to the police station and she just demands that they arrest Buck. Like, please, do something. It's getting worse. They say no. On May 6th, Tracy does request a restraining order, and it was granted. But that doesn't stop Buck. It is now May 23rd, and Buck shows up again to Tracy's home. Tracy calls the police, and she even says this to the police. I think this is just so... So sad. She says, look, if you're not going to arrest Buck and take him away, will you at least take me away? Take me to the police station to keep me safe. I just want to cry when I, I just, I can't even say the words knowing that this woman was so scared for her life that she's begging the police, take me, help me. Tracy is told that it is Memorial Day weekend and she's going to have to wait until the weekend is over. So she waits, which is insane, ridiculous, so dumb. Why would she have to wait? I don't know. This part confuses me. So she waits and goes back again. And you know what they say to her? They say, ma'am, the officer that's working your case is on vacation. So you're just going to have to wait until he gets back from vacation. Tracy's brother at this point is now like, what the hell is going on? Protect my sister. Why are you not protecting my sister? He is calling the police station and asking them this. Send someone to help her. And now the police are telling them, okay, we're going to arrest him on June 8th. But they don't. Who are they, they just picking random days? Like, they had too busy of a schedule? I guess we'll just go, you know what, you guys, just hold tight as many days as you can. We're going to be there on June 8th to take down this monster of a man. And then, then you know what, they don't arrest him on June 8th. They don't. And now, it is June 10th, and Buck shows back up to Tracy's apartment again. What happens that day at Tracy's friend's apartment is really horrific to think about, to talk about. I want to give the trigger warning here for the violence. And it's really hard to tell you what happened, but it was also really difficult to even watch the scene play out in the made-for-TV movie. It's gut-wrenching. Okay, so... Tracy, of course, calls the police when Buck arrives at her apartment, her friend's apartment. She is scared because her son is inside sleeping and she does not want CJ to hear or see any of this fighting, of this arguing. So she calls the police and to buy herself some time, she's kind of just staying inside of the house, waiting for the police to show up. And that would be the safest thing to do. But 15 minutes later, there are no police officers at all in sight. Nowhere. Tracy is getting anxious now because Buck is standing outside of the apartment just screaming his ass off. Get out here, Tracy. Get out here. And now she's worried about her friends, you know, because her friends are there too outside trying to calm Buck down. So Tracy takes a deep breath and she exits the apartment. She goes downstairs to the yard and she asks Buck, what, what do you want now? At this point, it is now 25 minutes after Tracy made that first phone call for help from the police. And that one single police officer has arrived. 
I did read that Tracy had a lot of say in what went into the made-for-TV movie. She helped with the screenwriter. And so in this part of the movie, they do kind of push the fact that the police officer that was about to arrive, his actual name was Frederick Petrovitz. He was an older gentleman who was almost in retirement from the police department, but he did take his sweet ass time getting to the scene and they do show some scenes in the movie. And I'm not sure if this is how it went down in real life, but in the movie, they show some scenes where he is just like so nonchalant, kind of joking with the other officers about why he doesn't really care about getting to this call in you know, a sensible amount of time. Tracy is outside. No help has arrived. She is trying to calm Buck down, who is just screaming at the top of his lungs to the point where neighbors are starting to come outside and gather around. Buck is going to chase Tracy around the yard. He's going to grab her by her hair, push her to the ground and stab her 13 times. Tracy's friends, Tracy's neighbors are screaming for him to stop. They are screaming for help. Tracy is screaming why and Buck keeps telling her, I hope you die. I want you to die. It is at this point that the police officer finally arrives, but he's just like a bumbling idiot. I've never even said that phrase in my life, but that is exactly what he's like. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to handle a situation like this. Like he's never been trained. He's never seen this. Now the neighbors are screaming at the police officer, like do something, get him, go arrest him, like at least grab him and handcuff him. And the officer instead, he takes the knife and while Buck is running up the stairs, now he's going to go get CJ. Everyone knows that. The officer just clumsily like takes the knife, opens his cop car trunk and throws the knife in the trunk. I mean, you know, thinking, well, he can't get to the knife now. So at least the knife is taken out of the equation. Tracy is lying there, completely bloody, dying. Buck has now taken CJ out of his bed. CJ screaming his head off with all the chaos, has no idea what's going on. The officer is doing nothing. The neighbors are screaming. The ambulance is still not there. And at this point, Buck goes downstairs with CJ in his arms goes over to Tracy's body laying on the ground and he starts just kicking her in the head, kicking her in the neck, stomping on her neck. He actually breaks her neck. He now is screaming, I killed your mother. I killed your fucking mother. I killed your fucking mother. While holding CJ, he then throws CJ onto Tracy, just drops this tiny baby boy, onto his bloody, unconscious mother. This is when the ambulance finally arrives, and it doesn't stop there. More officers are now on scene, but as the ambulance is trying to get Tracy to safety, get her into the ambulance, the police are, like, trying to help the the emergency team and they're like no go get that guy dude what are you doing and at this point buck just jumps he tries to jump into the ambulance and is still trying to kill tracy with all of these police around and these neighbors and the ambulance crew he is still trying to get in there and grab her and then they finally get buck They finally get Buck away from Tracy, and now Tracy is rushed to a hospital. Tracy was stabbed 13 times. Her spinal cord was damaged. The right side of her was partially numb. Her fingertips on her left hand were numb. Her left knee to her toes were numb. She had to have an emergency tracheotomy. She would have a scar across her throat a scar on her face. She would have to use a wheelchair, and when she woke up in the hospital, doctors told her that it is quite possible that she would be a quadriplegic. 
Tracy's lungs were filled with blood. She came into the hospital with a boot print bruise on her face and her esophagus was stabbed three times. She would need to spend eight months in that hospital. It is a miracle that Tracy survived. Buck is, of course, immediately arrested at this point, and he was going to have to stand trial. At this trial, Tracy actually hired her own bodyguard because she was so frightened of Buck still. Even surrounded by everyone in that courtroom, she couldn't do it. She hired someone to protect her. At the trial, it was said that Buck had been working at a diner in town and that he would often brag to the people that he worked with and to the customers that he was going to one day kill his wife. He would even brag to everyone and show off the exact knife that he was going to use to kill Tracy. Buck's lawyer tries to argue that It isn't his fault that he's emotionally unable to control his anger and it's not his fault. You know, he grew up this way and he just needs to get help. So the jury finds Buck guilty. They're like, no, hell no, this guy's going to jail. They find him guilty and he is sentenced to 20 years in prison. But does he spend 20 years in prison? No, of course not. He spends eight years in prison. And it is because his defense lawyer argued that the judge didn't tell the jury, he didn't say to their face that they couldn't, quote, look down on Buck for not testifying. So this mistake was going to now give Buck a retrial And then they decided on a plea agreement instead, and Buck only got eight years. I'm so confused by this little law here. You know what? Tracy ain't going out like that. So almost a year later, to the day of her attack, Tracy is now going to file a lawsuit against the city of Torrington, most specifically the city of Torrington Police Department for violating her civil rights and failing to protect her. This case was brought on by attorney Burton M. Weinstein. Now, he's an attorney that is very well known for his work involving police misconduct. So in 1984, when this lawsuit was filed, Tracy Thurman would become the first woman in America to sue a town individually and its police department for violating civil rights. So badass. Oh, yes. I'm going to just like everyone just stop for a minute and just like, hold on, let's clap. Tracy, we love you. Tracy is going to win this case, and she is going to be awarded $1.9 million. But she says she just wants to heal and be normal again. Her biggest dream was that she wanted to be able to lift CJ again because she couldn't hold her baby anymore. I do want to just point this out. Now, during this case, there was a defense attorney named Jesse Frankel, and now While Tracy's trying to prove that the police department didn't help her, I want to read to you what this Jesse Frankel said about Tracy to the court. He said, Tracy was not a battered woman. Most of those incidents were not physical confrontations. They were only phone calls. She was setting Buck up for divorce proceedings, building a record against him. Have you ever been so angry about something that you don't even have a word or any words to describe the person that said something so stupid? Yeah, that's that's what just happened. So Tracy wins her lawsuit and she does also make a statement. She says it wasn't a personal attack on me. They just weren't trained to handle this. The Thurman lawsuit brought about sweeping national reform of domestic violence laws, including the Thurman Law, a.k.a. the Family Violence Prevention and Response Act. 
instituted in Connecticut in 1986, which mandates police make arrests in domestic violence cases, even if the victim does not wish to press charges. Buck was released after eight years in prison, and he was given a lifetime restraining order from ever even being in Torrington at all. He did say at his parole hearing, Tracy, I will never bother you again. He ended up moving to Massachusetts, and he married a woman named Christine. They had a son, and everyone around them says that he was a great guy, he was never violent, his neighbors loved him, everyone loved him, but before he married Christine, a woman filed a restraining order against Buck, and she said that he choked her and sexually assaulted her. So, I don't know how well those neighbors really knew Buck. I watched this YouTube video by Brooke McKenna. I have it tagged in the show notes. She has a quote from Buck Thurman. Now, Buck was asked after he got out of jail to make a statement on what happened. And this is what Buck said. With the things I have been through with this in the last 20-something years, I am not really willing to talk about it. Every time I talk, it always comes back to hit me in the face. I am tired of hearing about it. I really, truthfully, just wish it would die, but I don't think it ever will. But if that's what they want to keep doing, so be it. Holy shit. I can't believe he said that. I mean, I can believe it. It's Buck. You know, he's the victim. Poor Buck. He has to listen to people talk all the time about how he tried to kill his wife. Fuck Buck. I found this in a Hartford, Connecticut newspaper. It was dated February 1st, 2002. The headline read, Son in domestic abuse case faces gun charge. Torrington, a 21-year-old man who got a break from a judge because he had witnessed the near-beating death of his mother, is behind bars again. Charles J., CJ, was a toddler when his father, Charles Thurman, stabbed and beat his mother, Tracy, on a Torrington street in June of 1983. Charles was arrested over the weekend on a weapons possess- possession charge after police said they found a semi-automatic handgun inside his apartment during a January 25th 2002 search. Charles was 18 when he was arrested on charges of stealing $22,000 in gambling proceeds from an ex-girlfriend's relative three years ago, according to court records. I found the most I could find said that Charles ended up getting into a lot of trouble with the law, and the most recent that I found was that he was serving a 15-year prison sentence And that was ordered in August of 2010. Tracy likes to remain private. And even after everything happened, she only really did two really major interviews. That was for the Today Show and for 2020. Her main thing is she just wanted to move on with her life and be normal again. Just like that's what she always wanted. Happily, Tracy did marry. She married a man named Mike Matuzik. Michael Matuzik said in an interview that he and Tracy were actually supposed to meet at a wedding. His brother was getting married to Tracy's best friend, and they were both supposed to be the best man and the maid of honor, but Tracy had just been in the hospital at that point in time, so she never did get to meet Michael that day, but they still ended up together. And Michael was quoted as saying this, I was the best man and Tracy was supposed to be the maid of honor, but she was in the hospital. Everyone says she's lucky to have me, but I'm the one who is lucky. In 2006, Tracy was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and she had to have her thyroid removed. And while doctors were operating on her, they found pieces of her thyroid behind her collarbone and in her lungs from the attack. To this day, Tracy fights for other domestic violence victims. Tracy spoke with the CT Coalition Against Domestic Violence. 
when I'm out in the store and someone comes up to me and approaches me and says, you know, you saved my life or you've changed my life. That is, it was all worth what I went through to hear that. It makes me feel honored that they look up to me, that could better their life. I'm very fortunate that I'm here to be able to share my story. And I also feel like I have an obligation to the people that weren't as lucky as I to be their voice for them. And it is rewarding to me to know that, God, if I could save one person from what I had gone through, this, I mean, this is why I do it. Thank you so much for joining me again this week on Residue. I appreciate it so much. If you are enjoying the show, maybe leave a review or just share it with your friends. Tell everyone else about Residue and come back here every Tuesday to hang out with me. You can find me on Instagram at Residue Podcast, TikTok Residue Podcast, Facebook Residue, a true crime podcast. And if you want, maybe just DM me. Tell me what kind of cases you want to hear or tell me about some stories from your hometown. I just appreciate all of you so much and I hope that you all stay safe and stay paranoid.